So, I was watching Snam the other week where he attempted to beat Alien Isolation in something labelled the hardest achievement I've ever done. A pretty big statement coming from one of the gaming gods themselves, but watching Snam's sanity devolve over the past seven months making this challenge, it had piqued my interest. The challenge in question was to beat Isolation on Nightmare difficulty whilst also going for the one-shot achievement. Now, Nightmare difficulty ramps up the rage quitting potential of the game quite substantially, but alongside the one-shot achievement, it meant that you needed to get through all of this and beat the game without dying. A certified recipe to making you want to Alt F4 in real life. This challenge looked extremely unhealthy, both physically and mentally. So, naturally, I was 100% in. But there was no way that we could create something like this in Resident Evil, right? Well, if there's a will, there's a way. And today, to match the rules of this legendary run, we'd be playing through Claire's story on the hardest difficulty the game had to offer. Every enemy in the game was now the perfect organism, but to further align our rules to Isolation's nightmare mode, we'd have no heads-up display, helping to make our questionable aim even more questionable and also removed access to the various maps that we'd find throughout the game. Now, no map wouldn't usually be an issue, but my knowledge of Claire's scenario was dodgy at best, so the map and HUD combo would have undoubtedly helped us track down items that we probably would have missed. But what really raised the stakes here was that coupled with the one-shot achievement, dying was now illegal in Raccoon City. Mayor Warren had outlawed the usage of ink ribbons and typewriters in the city, and with Hardcore not having any autosaves, it meant that this run had received the infamous permadeath stamp. Any moment where the aliens would fold us in half during this challenge, we wouldn't be heading back to the comfort of a cosy save room. We'd be thrown back to the start of the game. From here on out, if victory couldn't be achieved without death, then it wouldn't be achieved. And with Umbrella's alien creations escaping from their underground facility and reproducing at rates that would outstrip Nick Cannon, it meant that Claire Ripley's life was constantly in danger of being ended. It was probably good to get the first death and the second and the third out of the way nice and early to help take the pressure off this permadeath run through the apocalyptic replica of LV-426, arriving at the RPD a few minutes later. We immediately move through to the East Wing hallway where we help to unblock one of the flooded toilets in the bathroom, before witnessing the Lieutenant Dan origin story. Before we can read through the Colonial Marines little notebook, we're immediately thrown into our first battle inside the RPD with the aliens. The problem now was that the corridors of the precinct could be extremely claustrophobic. What didn't help this situation either was that whilst this alien variant was a stunningly efficient killer who could split your body in half in a heartbeat, it was basically blind. To compensate, it was highly sensitive to noise, meaning that running, shooting and making any noise around them would alert the alien to our presence. <laughs> Having barely made it to the press room, all we'd done is sandwich ourselves in between death. I really needed to focus up here. This wasn't like any other challenge I'd ever attempted. Whilst we could afford to be sloppy in other runs we'd done together, permadeath meant that every mistake I made, particularly in the late game, could cost us. It wasn't like we could reset multiple times to get the outcome we wanted. Mistakes were permanent and every decision would count. Including the decision to pour myself a quadruple vodka Red Bull, which helped to get me back to the RPD in a heartbeat. This time, we were actually able to pull Lieutenant Dan from the shutter and save his life before we both just full send it back to the main hall, which was a surprisingly effective tactic. However, once we'd made it through like the Sith, Marvin had decreed that there could only be one lieutenant in the RPD and crushed Lieutenant Dan's head in the shutter. No! Marvin reveals that the entire RPD was now infested with aliens who had emerged from the sewers connected to the station and made a nice little home here. In the ensuing battle, Marvin reveals that he had regrettably been impregnated with one of the alien embryos and would shortly be giving birth to it. Even though the dad was no longer in the picture, Marvin was going to do the right thing and raise that little alien as his own. Whilst Marvin's fate was sealed, he says we could still make it out of here alive. We head off into the corridors of the RPD to begin our search for the three medallions that we could use to unlock the secret exit in the main hall. It wasn't going to be easy though. The aliens had ravaged the precinct, turning this man into a piece of salami and breaking into all of the vending machines to steal the snacks. These things were absolute demons, and currently our ability to defend ourselves was limited to this very sketchy looking kitchen gun, which had limited ammo and the damage output of a back scratcher. This meant that we were basically weaponless until something else became available. Making it to the third floor, we try to avoid this alien blocking the stairs, but end up getting slapped across the face as we frantically try to grab the first of the three precinct keys from this desk. How fast can you get back here? 
Luring the aliens away from the door by loudly running over here allows us to sneak back through to the entrance hall and meet up with Marvin, who is apparently embracing his imminent move to motherhood. Over on the west wing, we can open up the safe in the second floor waiting room and get an exclusive look at GTA 6 as this guy lands a helicopter inside the police station. Excuse me, mate, you can't park there. We meet up with one of the synthetics outside and alien invasions aside, these two were still pretty socially awkward. After the android leaves to find an alternative way into the station, the alien army only seemed to be getting bigger. We need to make it down into the sewers to find their hive and put a stop to their shenanigans as soon as possible. Once back in the precincts, we carefully edge around the aliens in the east office to find the fuse and the red handle, which we could now use to get through to the star's office. Heading into Leon's welcome party, we can unlock his desk to find the speed loader, but would have to come back later for the safe in Marvin's office as there was a visitor in there who refused to move. What is the charge? Eating a meal? A succulent Chinese meal? Arriving back in the corridor we'd been in earlier, carefully walking and avoiding the aliens was no longer an option, so we'd have to hold our breath, clench our bum holes, and make a run for it. Once in the safety of the ops briefing room, we can slice the chain off the supply closet door and get the first half of the detonator before heading upstairs to the men's locker room where we could turn off the steam using the red handle. It must have been a sign of how on edge I was feeling because despite knowing everything there is to know about this game, even the most simplest of jump scares seem to be getting to me. We pass an alien on the roof enjoying a human kebab before finding a ton of useful stuff inside the star's office, including the battery which we could use to complete the detonator and blow the barrier to the maiden medallion up on the third floor. As soon as I finish this puzzle, I'm getting slapped in the face. I just saw that out of the corner of my eye. A few inches later... We again have to distract the aliens in the library in order for us to get out of there quietly and with minimal disruption. But with the Maiden Medallion now in our possession, we could place it alongside the Unicorn and Lion Medallions to reveal the secret room. With Marvin's contractions now starting, it was probably a good time to head out of there and get some milk, which allowed us to begin exploring the underground machinery room where we find a young girl hiding in amongst the wreck control room. We reach out a caring hand to her and ask for her name. Newt. My name's Newt. <laughs> That's a weird fucking name, man. But before we could shit on this 12-year-old any further, we get jumped by the alien's master architect, Willie B. Instead of having a master queen, these aliens had a master father. Now, my plan had been to use the knife here because in Resident Evil 2 Remake, it's absolutely f broken in terms of its ability to dish out insane amounts of damage. But like the absolute tool that I am, I managed to get grabbed by Birkin almost straight away and forgot this wasn't Resident Evil 4 stabbing him in his eye to escape, but losing my only knife in the process. It was now up to the pea shooter, and with a smidgen of health left, this was certainly a fight that would keep my cortisol levels nice and high. Just how I like them. But luckily, despite being quite scary, you can easily predict Birkin's very obvious movement patterns to help ensure we stayed well ahead of him. And after we pepper his eye with what was basically wet tissue paper, we can eventually overpower G1. The weird little lizard girl pushes down the ladder for us, but not long afterwards, we're greeted by resident sex offender and pistol whipper of women, Chief Irons, who kidnaps Gecko or whatever the f her name was, and takes her off to the Neverland Ranch. In the police kennels, the aliens had been feasting on the little sausage dogs in here, and after discovering all sorts of weird shit going on inside the morgue, the last gurney had an alien carcass on it in cold storage. A fascinating opportunity to study the specimen. But next to its body was the diamond precinct key, which the alien wasn't happy about us taking, but who cared what that guy thought. The way back through the kennels was pretty hairy due to the alien's positioning, which at times could be anywhere from the wall to the ceiling. But as a reward for making it through, we are able to grab a new pistol, the JMB HP3 Element OP, which we could take for a quick tester out on the firing range. After taking care of those two nerds, we grab the flame rounds and find the stock for the grenade launcher before reactivating the power to the lift, which gets us up to Chief Irons' office which certainly had the kind of decor that you'd expect from someone who cupped and smelled their own farts. This is a lovely room of death. Take care now. Bye-bye then. Questionable office aesthetics aside, we now needed to get two power panel components to complete this circuit board and access the mountain of parking permits the chief was hoarding to get us over to the orphanage, which with the heart key, we could head upstairs to floor three and awkwardly move past the aliens roaming around in here to find the first one, as well as the large cog we'd need to get the second one. However, enthralled by the progress we were making, things were now about to change, and not for the better. After turning on the water pump and dousing the fire from the helicopter crash, in a terrible twist of fate, something terrifying had arrived in the RPD. Umbrella's insatiable appetite at speedrunning how many human experimentation laws they could breach in a week had led them down the path of splicing human and alien DNA together, which had produced... 
whatever this was. The newborn from Resurrection had severe mummy issues, extreme durability against conventional weaponry, and a distinct lack of cake. Ugh. But as a wise man once said, I didn't want none unless you've got buns, hun. And despite this thing looking like it might snap in half if you breathed on it too hard, its presence here had left me feeling uneasy. Not only was this guy now hunting me down through the RPD, determined to push my head in like Play-Doh, but up until now, we've been able to walk slowly and tactically around the aliens in the RPD, helping to avoid unnecessary conflict and ensuring my precious life remained intact. This thing's arrival, however, had really cock-blocked that safety mechanism. Depending on where and if it found us, it could force us to run in areas to escape it where we really didn't want to, often alerting aliens to our presence and severely increasing the possibility of retrieving that milk from the gas station for Marvin. As the situation in the RPD devolved further into madness, we could at least congratulate Marvin on the birth of his baby, which was now out, fully grown, and stuck inside the sofa. The plan was now to use our two new keys to unlock the remaining doors in the RPD, but with the situation as it was, we started with a well-needed upgrade to our weaponry situation. Unlocking the laundry room gives us the second portable safe, containing the spare button to the armory keypad, and after spending more time than I'd like to admit working out the combinations... <sighs> I swear to God. We could begin our shopping spree. It was lucky that we didn't have to share any of this with Leon like in the original because I pillaged every single goddamn thing in here, including using the armory key to get the grenade launcher. And now this thing was a lifesaver. It one-shotted most of the aliens in the RPD and helped barbecue that weird lanky creature hunting us down if it ever breached the distance laid out in our restraining order. With our weaponry sufficiently upgraded, we could finally take out the squatter in Marvin's office and pick up the pouch from the safe before putting the book back in the statue's hand to gift us the red gem. Things, however, were just getting creepier and sketchier the further we made it through the game, and the stress of losing my progress was starting to take its toll on me. Garner could come calling at any moment, and the thought of having to do all of this again was making the vein in my forehead bulge. But the only way was forward, and sometimes backwards, but mostly forward. The next step was to grab the jack handle from the records room, where, with Mr. X currently on fire on the west wing, miles away from the records room, we could collect it in relative peace. Oh my fucking Christ, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> oh my god, he's actually chasing me. <laughs> God, Jesus Christ. Whilst being chased by a walking nuclear fusion reaction made this slightly less relaxing than we'd hoped for, we did have the jack in hand, and after looping Mr. X around the record shelves, we proceeded to win another game of hide and seek in the main entrance hall before heading up into the library to gain access to the clock tower. With the aliens cremated in here, we could now work in subjective peace, which apparently the newborn wasn't very happy about. But after it leaves without tearing our spinal cord out, we can proceed with moving the bookcases across to create a makeshift bridge. Whilst we'd secured the second electrical piece, our health levels had tanked and had reached an all-time low. It made me feel immensely uneasy not having some kind of buffer to my life, especially as Mr. X could just appear in a doorway and smash my face in. So after some searching, we'd found two herbs that we could potentially use to offset that anxiety. The only catch was that they were in a dead end and guarded by two aliens. It seemed almost like a trap that I was being lured into with the promise of sweet, sweet green healing, but I was confident in my abilities. What could go wrong here? Oh my god, you're joking. Honestly, you lanky piece of shit. We at least managed to get our red and green heal off for that safety buffer and force these guys to stare directly into a solar eclipse, allowing us to escape the dead end of death and with a spare herb in pocket. We grab the jewelry box from the interview room downstairs which gives us the star's oosp, and after putting the electrical pieces in place we were reminded again that this was a top three contender for the most insane systems for simple tasks that I'd ever seen in my life. Honestly, how does anyone do anything around here? But once completed, the phone ominously rings out. What's up? What's up? Yo, Duke! Pick up the phone! What's up? What's up? Oh! With the Star Shield, we could grab the Mac 10 from the Star's armory before heading down to the parking lot to open up the shutters to begin our journey over to the orphanage. Having not paid my $150 parking ticket, the traffic warden arrived to stop us from leaving, but luckily my Dead by Daylight experience comes in clutch for the second time in a Resident Evil challenge as we loop him around the car before slamming a pallet on his big old forehead. This unfortunately seemed to piss him off. Jesus, why are you so- <laughs> 
a lot and was an aggravating factor of the complete clusterfuck that occurred at the gate outside Kendo's place where we barely made it through with our life intact. This was definitely the closest we'd come to death so far and once my blood pressure had returned to normal, we saw that Kendo's roof was smashed and letting rainwater in so we do our good deed for the day and help to keep him and his zombie kid warm. Now, en route to the orphanage, I had hoped that we could stealthily move like Solid Snake through the aliens here to preserve my extremely low ammo count. But these aliens were on a mission to clap these cheeks, which wasn't part of the plan. I'd now used up all of my reserve ammo, had a fading heartbeat both in-game and in real life, and was sitting precariously on the edge of failure. With the Ian Beale of inventories, it felt like my inevitable fate had been sealed. I had no other options here but to put it all on the line and make a run for the bus. Oh, there's no way. Oh my god. <sighs> this was a tough one to take. And as the saying goes, when it rains, it pours. That is, unless you're Robert Kendo, where it pours napalm instead. After this defining moment, it was like a domino effect. Death after death after desk smash after death. We just couldn't catch a break. But with every death, I learned. I became better and then became marginally worse before becoming better once again. I was like a phoenix rising from the ashes and within no time at all, we'd made it back to the orphanage, but more importantly, we'd been able to save a ton more ammo and healing items in the process. I'd also found enough high-grade gunpowder to craft copious amounts of acid rounds. Umbrella's alien protégés hadn't developed their iconic acidic blood yet, but th that wasn't a problem because I was gonna put it in there for them. After a careful run through the northern streets, we arrive at the orphanage, which probably felt as welcoming as arriving at Jeffrey Epstein's island for dinner. Trashed playground, unmarked graves, weird f***ing taxidermy factory in the back. It was the kind of place you'd expect to find crack addicts, not children, but one thing it did have going for it was a first aid spray hidden in the upstairs bathroom, which we grabbed before bumping into Chief Irons downstairs, who had been infected by one of the facehuggers and received some very satisfying karma. We find the lizard girl in the basement downstairs, but when Mr. X catches up to us, it was every man for themselves as we beelined it straight for the sewer section. Now, you may be wondering what this black screen is. This isn't a recording error. This is live footage. After fighting for my life to make it back here, my game died. It had executed Order 66 on itself at the worst possible moment. I mean, no moment was good, but this was particularly tough. I had no way to be certain, but I assumed that my disgusting Mr. X mod had caused my game to run nlife.exe when loading this cutscene, but there was no way to be sure. I took the night off and went to bed staring at the ceiling for half the night in a rage fueled stasis before coming back fresh the next day. I verified my file's integrity to ensure it was honest and had strong principles, uninstalled the Mr. X mod and made repeated thoughts and prayers to the Capcom gods to allow me passage to the sewers. And here I was, back at the gas station. For a change, through no fault of my own, but this was still a real low point. It felt like we had a mountain to climb to get back to where we were, but mountains were there to be climbed and climb it, we did. I was more efficient than I ever was. I was more attractive than I ever was. And I was more accurate than I ever was. And three hours later, we were back. All that was left now was to pray to all the gods that this was enough. Oh, thank God. Jesus. <laughs> Entering the sewers for the first time, we head straight through to the control tower, where we meet mother of the year contender Annette B, who was quite happy to just leave her child to entertain herself in the middle of a literal dumpster while she played Candy Crush over in the lab. <sighs> Seeing as nobody else was taking responsibility for the Komodo dragon, I guess we'd have to. We start by heading over the bridge and entering the main sewer area with an additional objective. We'd need to retrieve all of the chess pieces to unlock the garbage room door and find the alien hive that Marvin had told us about but being so close to the hive brought a new enemy type into play. The alien queens, who were the manufacturers of the facehuggers and a primary cause of this alien baby boom here in Raccoon City. We catch the lift up to the waterway overpass where we find five aliens guarding the way ahead, but taking the extra time to carefully take them out pays dividends as we take no damage, which then allows us to collect the resources from the storage room and unlock the utility door to reveal a secret lift back to the RPD. We grab the Mac-10 silencer using the star shield and after watching this alien drown in raw sewage, we take the rook plug and begin our journey back to the chess panel. On the way back, however, we unlock a doorway where the mechanism on the other side had been completely destroyed, almost as if someone had tried to stop something from getting out.
And that's when we found it, the alien nesting grounds. The hive resin was glowing in the dull lights of the sewers and felt alive. There was an eerie, unwelcoming glow to the place, like we weren't supposed to be here. Men had been cocooned to the walls and implanted with chestburster embryos with new aliens being born right in front of our very eyes. Despite one of the alien mothers thinking I was her child and trying to feed me regurgitated diarrhea, we take out the alien guarding the last two chest pieces as well as a weapon that would really help to level the playing field. The Sparkshot was a decommissioned police weapon originally designed to electrocute innocent members of the Raccoon City public, but it also turned out to be insanely effective at killing aliens, which was just what we needed. The return leg through the G-Adult area was tense but easily doable, and with yet again another absolutely mind-blowing solution to what was effectively a lock, we restore power to the garbage area. But on the way back, after finding out we'd been obliterating his children in the hive, Birkin's determination to wear us like a ventriloquist dummy was making me hyperventilate. We were now nearly four hours into this attempt, and whilst this boss fight under normal circumstances would be straightforward, the permadeath rule had added a noticeable amount of pressure to it. But with the reinforced frame for the SLS-60 retrieved from the sewer safe, however, we could convert the pea shooter into a weapon of mass destruction, and despite my rustiness and nerves, open, open, we do just enough to pull through and send Birkin down into the abyss. However, on rescuing Sherry from the garbage area, she'd apparently developed the world's worst case of pink eye I'd ever seen. <laughs> Sherry would need immediate medical assistance, which she would get after we spent two hours doubling back through the RPD to sniff out any missed items. During our adventures while Sherry was basically dying back on the monorail, we developed some film and find the hidden locations for the extended Mac-10 magazine and some spark shot bolts. We also find some interesting pictures stashed away in Wesker's desk, which under normal circumstances would land him 20 years in horny jail. With Mr. X also debowed, peace was again restored to the RPD, and we could make our way through the rest of the precinct without being molested against our will. With everything collected, it was time to say bye-bye and enter the final act of the game, the lab. We start the monorail and drop Sherry off in the security room. Not gonna lie, she was looking pretty disgusting, but on the bright side, she looked like she could probably audition for one of the aliens from District 9. They're the same picture. If she had any hope of survival, she'd need some vitamin gummy bears as soon as possible. So we set off into the lab with the feeling of existential dread looming over our every step. Things weren't going to get any easier in here, but the spark shot really came into its own in the lab. After we rustle up some eggs and pancakes, we grab the chip from the level 2 wristband and find an upgrade to the spark shot for even more electricity. Arriving at Nest's sprawling infrastructure, we find the original storage area where the xenomorphs had been bred, which just looked like botanical gardens. It didn't strike me as the best place to store ultimate killing machines, but after electrocuting the first two aliens and heading inside, we find that the place was still absolutely infested. There are at least six aliens in here alone, and they were absolutely everywhere. Our first stop is taking the canister over to the drug testing lab to fill it up with green juice, before sneaking past the liquor guarding the ladder to make it down to B2. Once in the lounge area, three aliens were waiting to greet us. They're quite awkwardly placed in here, but if we head through the lounge and upstairs first and avoid getting decapitated by this guy, we can clear out the rest of the aliens upstairs, grab the power unit, and on returning to the lounge, their positioning is a little more easier for us to deal with. With the power restored, we could cool the green cucumber juice and head back upstairs to destroy the aliens' secondary hive. This liquid would flow down through here and into the sewers to begin destroying all traces of the aliens' nests. With the purple upgrade ship in hand, this alien could sense that the end was nigh and thought they had us trapped. But one electrocution to the brain later, we primed the grenade launcher for anybody else who wanted a piece. But luckily, we didn't need it and could progress on to the testing lab. The nerves were getting real. My palms were sweaty, my knees were feeling weak, arms were also getting heavy, and I'd just thrown up spaghetti all over my desk. The reason for this very potent nervousness heading into G3 was that I fucked up. Grabbing the final pouch from this room felt fairly innocuous. All that was needed was a straight up murder on this alien that comes out of the locked bed and a snatch and grab on the pouch. But this wasn't just any alien. This was apparently Keanu Reeves. And he'd read me like a book. And with one swift slice of the alien's razor sharp talons, I'd lost all of my health. The health that was supposed to help get me through G3. I had one triple herb left and nothing in reserve. There was the first aid spray that was in the boss arena for G3, but there was every chance that we might not even make it to it. Scraping the spaghetti off my desk, we'd just have to make it work. The alternative was the gas station, and there was no way in hell I was going back there. 
I limped all the way over to the P4 testing lab, planning to take a hit of that sweet, sweet triple herb when we hit the start of G3, which would allow us to make use of the additional damage reduction bonus. After finding what looked like the biggest kidney stones I'd ever seen, we retrieved the vitamin C gummy bear Sherry needed to cure her pink eye and head into the G3 boss fight, running on nothing but pure adrenaline and a little bit of Viagra. After being lowered down into the boss arena, we pop the triple herb, but the fight gets off to an immediate bad start, which almost brought me to tears. But we fight back, using the acid rounds to stun him temporarily and help maintain a healthy distance from his attacks. We take out his opening trio of eyes with the Mac 10 and get trypophobia, knifing G3's chest eyes. My heart rate had reached unbelievable highs. It was now or never. Mainly because at this many beats per minute, my heart could literally explode at any moment. With one final dodge, we run dry on the Mac 10 and the grenade launcher, but firing a spark shot at his central chest, the bar penetrates his eyes and... Yes! Oh, get Birkin. <laughs> oh my god, thank god. We may have been crippled, but we were still alive. Arriving back at the Amphibian's family reunion, Sherry's pink eye had been cured, but Annette wasn't looking so good. She looked quite dry, like she needed a moisturizer or a chapstick or something, but she tells us that rather than push through to care for her child, she'd signed her over to Claire and peaced out. I guess that was one way to get out of the contractual obligations of parenthood. With the lab's reactor core now overloaded, the lab would self-destruct, eliminating the invasive alien species for good and preventing it from escaping out of Raccoon City. That also meant it would obliterate us if we didn't make it out of here in time. Making our daring escape, Sherry appeared to have made it abundantly clear that she just wanted to kill both of us. Reaching this section here, I planned on taking the aliens out from up here at a nice safe distance, but as soon as Sherry stood on the lift, she pressed the button to go down. Sabotage aside, we send Sherry over to unlock the door, and against my better judgement, we save her life as one of the aliens tries to rugby tackle her as she made her way over. Get away from her, you bitch! We do send Sherry's eyebrows as payback as we take down the final alien of the run before we find a strange transmission coming over the airways in the turntable control room. <laughs> Didn't know this was on. <laughs> Fuck. Once power had been restored using the joint plugs, it was now time for us to take on G4, the final hurdle of this epic marathon of a challenge. Despite the success of this run hinging on this fight, the weaponry at my disposal had left me feeling pretty confident that I wouldn't choke this. We unload all 500 minigun rounds into G4's face and his weird little eyeballs. His attacks were easy to predict and dodge, and after the minigun runs dry and our final flame round cooks him to medium rare, we were down to only our pistol. But if Birkin wanted stars, we'd give him stars. With the final boss defeated as the lab blew up around us, we asked Sherry what she wanted to do next. I want to see where you live. You're a very strange individual. But what we wanted to do was see if we could beat Resident Evil 2 Remake if it was Alien Isolation, which the answer to was yes. This definitely was no way as hard as Slam's insane Alien Isolation run, but I'll definitely be looking forward to enjoying what it was like to have a resting heart rate for a few days. That is before we take on our next challenge.